ready to go. Just ready to go. All right. Well, we're going to get started here. I'd like to welcome everybody to the our first actual Zoom Hummingbird webinar. We're trying to do some different things in the time of COVID. I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the U.S. Forest Service and the the Friends of Land Between Lakes, which is an organization that I actually work for as an interpreter. My name is John Polpeter. I'm the lead naturalist. I've been working here at the Woodlands Nature Station for the last 20 years. And one of the things I love is hummingbirds. Hummingbirds is one of the most spectacular animals I've ever got to work with. One of the special reasons why I like to work with hummingbirds is because actually I'm a blind person. I don't see very well. And so being the smallest bird, you would think it'd be very difficult for me to be able to enjoy these, these fascinating feathered friends. But because they are a species that does not mind being in front of us, because it's a species that likes being around humans and taking advantage of humans' flowers and gardens and the special feeders that we give them, I have the opportunity to, to enjoy them like the rest of you. So as we're going along, you may see me kind of pause as I'm looking to, to try to figure out uh, what I'm gonna talk about next. Uh, feel free to ask any questions that you want. Down at the bottom of the screen, there are three different buttons. There's a chat, question and answer, and a raised hand. And what you can do during that is, I may from time to time ask a group question and you can go to chat and answer that question. And I have Ariane who will help kind of make those responses known to me. And then if you have a longer question or a deeper question that want to be answered, we can answer it at the end of the program. Do that through the question and answer. And we'll do those live. And then from time to time, I may also just take a poll and we'll do the raised hand. So why don't we start it off by testing these three buttons? Why don't we go ahead and the people that are involved, go ahead and announce who you are uh, through chat. You can also answer if you want, if you already have hummingbirds at your, hum at your, your house. If the, if the fall migration is starting to happen, you're starting to see a lot of hummingbirds at your place. If you don't want to use chat, you definitely can use raised hand as well. Look. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get started on our PowerPoint. My, my handy assistant, Shannon, is going to get the PowerPoint started. So just give us a few seconds as we get ready. So the thing, the title of this program is the five easy steps to track hummingbirds. We're going to try to break it down into, into these different steps to make it easier for us to increase the number of hummingbirds that we have at our house or in our neighborhood or increase the, to make the habitat that the hummingbirds are living in better for them. So let's get started on that. And as we go along, remember, you can all do the question and answer button or through chat. Uh, and maybe respond through raised hand. All right, here at the Nature Station, what is this Nature Station? We've been actually working with hummingbirds for the last 30 years. 
what you see, the scene like you're seeing right now, is not uncommon during the month of August. We've actually seen this month coming for a month. It makes it kind of a unique time to come to the Nature Station because we have close to 200 to 250 hummingbirds a day through the months of July, August, and September. And what usually happens in the month of August is the peak of our migration, which used to happen around the beginning of August, around the first weekend, for instance. And that's typically when we have our hummingbird festival, which is one of our more popular festivals that we have in the Nature Station. But as, as the climate has been changing, uh, we have been noticing that our peak is actually a little bit more in the middle of August, around August 15th or August 20th. So when you come to the nature station at this time of the year, you'll see a lot of the different hummingbirds. Most of the males have left, they usually are the first to migrate out, and then it's followed by the females uh, and the juveniles uh, that are moving through all the way from Canada uh, into our area. So let's kind of talk about hummingbirds in general. Uh, there are about 328 species of hummingbirds found in the, throughout the world. And particularly, they're only found in one part of the world, which is the New World, North America and South America. And these particular species of birds, most of these ones that you see pictured in front of you now, are the species that are found mainly in North America. Majority of our diversity of hummingbirds are found in two counties in southern Arizona, typically around Tucson. If you want to go see about 17 species of hummingbirds, that's a good place to, to go see them. So we have close to 24 species of hummingbirds that may live in the United States uh, th uh, throughout the country. Uh, you might notice that you, in the top left, you get the rufous hummingbird, which is basically the almost the Western version of the ruby-threaded hummingbird. And they have a unique thing in that they are the longest migrator of all hummingbirds. They can actually migrate about 3,000 miles. That's from Alaska all the way down to Mexico. Every so often during the winter, so if so, you hear somebody actually having a hummingbird in their yard over here in the eastern part of the United States, most likely it's going to be a rufous because they are a cold, hardy species. Obviously, they live in Alaska and Canada during the summer months when it's kind of comparable to Kentucky winters in some cases. And they can live here. And a lot of times when they're living here in uh, Western Kentucky during the winter months, they're actually drinking tree sap from yellow-bellied sap suckers or eating insects. There's not a lot of flowers during that time period, so they have to go to some other sources. Also pictured on this one are the black chin hummingbird, which is another bird that can be found here during the winter months. Uh, the Anna's hummingbird, which is mainly found in California, Arizona, maybe Oregon, and that is a permanent resident of the United States. It's one of the few hummingbirds that actually stays here year round. What's unique also about it, it is the first bird of the, that nests in the year. Great horned owls are after that, but the Anna's hummingbird nests in December or January. So it's one of the first birds that actually nests during this time period. And the last thing I'm gonna mention is the calliope, which is the smallest hummingbird. It's the second smallest hummingbird in the world. It only weighs about two grams, maybe 2.3 grams. And uh, it is found in the Rockies, uh, at the very tops of the mountains is where you find it. It is only beat by size by the bee hummingbird, which is found in Cuba, which can weigh less than two grams, pretty small little bird. But 99.999% of all the birds that you're gonna see in your backyard are this species here, the ruby-throated hummingbird. It is the most dominant one because it's the only one that actually breeds a nest in the eastern United States, from Canada to Florida to Texas, and into the Midwest. Once you start getting to those deeper prairie states, they, it, they have a harder time because there's not the tree structures that they like to be around. Importantly is to be able to tell the difference between males and females. Hummingbirds are a species of bird that has a lot of sexual dimorphism, which basically means there's a big difference between males and females. If you look at the left, uh, there is the ruby-throated hummingbird male. And he can be told apart from the other ones by that red gorget, also the red throat. Uh, it is a way for him to be attracted to the females. The, the brighter the color, the more shiny the color, the more attractive he is to the females. It shows how healthy he is and how many resources he has to offer her. You also notice he does not have any other markings on his tails, which can be significant when you look at the other guys. They tend to be smaller than the females. Now the female, as I mentioned before, is larger than males, but has a white throat. What's significant is that on the tail feathers, they have white dots at the bottom. 
That's one of the big ways that you can tell an adult female. Uh, and if you look at the juvenile there, juvenile male, juvenile female, they kind of look like the adult females. That's done on purpose because males are extremely territorial and they will take on all comers, especially juvenile males. So if you're a juvenile male and you want to get to a food source because you need to be able to survive, you try to look more like mama, not like papa. If you look like papa, you're going to be aggressively attacked. Uh, so they often have the white throat. And really the only way to tell a juvenile male from uh, a, the females is the black streaking, or sometimes you might see a few red feathers, kind of like a little chest hair on a teenage boy. Uh, by the time he comes back the next year for the next spring, you'll have that full red gorget and be ready to breed. All right, one of the things I love to talk about with hummingbirds is just how amazing they are. The fact that some of their statistics and, and their abilities to do certain things. Now, Think about this. This little tiny bird is able to hover, fly upside down, go backwards. It's able to do this because it's pollinating those flowers. And for the for the, be able to spend that time pollinating those flowers, it has to have this kind of capability. Also, for it to be able to just hover there, it has to be able to flap its wings. And it can actually flap its wings 60 to 80 times per second. Take a minute there and think about how much you can actually flap your wings in a second maybe one, maybe two times, if you're lucky for fast. But really, we can't do a lot of things in, in a minute uh, or in a, a second that fast. Um, along with that, these birds also have a high metabolism, which their heart rate can get up to 1,200 times per minute. That's quite a bit. Um, one of the things I always like to also point out is that the male hummingbirds, when they're doing a display, and often people, if you have hummingbird feeders at your house, during the springtime, particularly April and May, you may notice this behavior. A male hummingbird with the red gorget, the red throat, will fly in a U-shaped fashion back and forth in your yard. And what he's doing during that time period, he's trying to display to those females. He's trying to be impressive. And he often will flap his wings 200 times per second. That's quite a bit of fast. So I mean, that is considerably faster than 60 to 80 times per second in their normal resting flight. Our ruby throat hummingbirds are fast. They can actually go about 50 to 60 miles per hour. But the green violet ear, which one has been spotted in Cincinnati once, which is typically more of a Costa Rican variety, uh, did was clocked at flying at 93 miles per hour. So that makes it one of the fastest birds that you're going to find in the animal kingdom. One of the things that these guys are doing now is it's very important for them to be able to build up uh, their fat reserves for their migration. As I mentioned before, this is the peak of their hummingbird migration. So we're getting the birds right now from Canada, Michigan, Illinois, flying through the Land Between Lakes area. Now, one of the things they do is they're coming through the Land Between Lakes area, following some of the um, water pathways like the, the large rivers. And Land Between Lakes itself makes a nice green interstate because it has a lot of particularly good resources and not a lot of things that it has to worry about. So hummingbirds do move through here quite a bit. Typically during the summer, a hummingbird, ruby throat hummingbird, will weigh about two to three grams. It's very important and why we see a lot more increased activity at our feeders because they're trying to put on the bulk. They're trying to get those empty calories to build up the fat cells uh, that will take them across the Gulf of Mexico. So they're going to actually have to double their weight. They're going to go from three grams to about six grams or seven grams. When we were doing the study, when we got the numbers of hummingbirds that we had in our backyard, uh, when we would band them, we would often flip them over on their back and look at their belly. Their belly is kind of a clear patch of skin. And underneath there, you can actually see these yellow glob globs of, of fat. And that is how we could tell if they were fit enough to be able to fly across the Gulf of Mexico. If they did not weigh that weight or have those globs of fat, then we did not think that they were going to be able to survive that, that long journey. The migration for the ruby throats is not as long as the rufus, but it is a good size migration. From land between lakes, they're going to fly about a thousand miles to the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. If you've ever been to Cancun, that's pretty much where they're going to be starting to land. Um, they leave land between lakes and head for the Texas coast. 
once they make it to the Texas coast, they're going to have to fly across that Yucatan Peninsula in about 18 hours. It's a nonstop flight with no meal service provided. Often these guys don't even fly in flocks. It's loose aggregations. Uh, maybe you'll hear uh, a few other birds along with them. Uh, sometimes people notice them when they're uh, taking a rest on an oil well or a boat, but for the most part, it is a nonstop flight until they get to the coast of Mexico. Once down there, they're going to spread out from the Yucatan Peninsula or southern Mexico all the way down to Panama. In particular, what scientists have been finding that most of the ruby throat hummingbirds anyway are hanging out on the western portions of the Central American uh, on the Pacific coast. And a lot of times on that side of the of the of Central America, they have a lot of aloe vera plantations. And you find an awful lot of hummingbirds, particularly the ruby throat hummingbirds, taking advantage of that. Costa Rica seems to be the hot spot for ruby-throated hummingbird migration. Now, they, they tend to do this starting in July, and then we get those hummingbirds back maybe about the first part of April. So you need to start planning for hummingbirds to come back into your yard maybe around April 1st. If we have a particularly warm spring, I would even say go as much as March 20th uh, to get your hummingbird feeders out and make sure that you have some plants available for them to be attracted to if you want hummingbirds in your yard for the year. So, what, what about, what are we gonna talk about to try to attract them to our yard? How can we help? How can we make our yard more hummingbird friendly? Well, there basically is the five easy steps. We're gonna talk about feeder care. We are gonna talk about flowers. We are gonna talk about shelter. We're gonna talk about water and some attention and care of some problems that typically people have when they start bringing a lot of sugar water into your yard. Um, the first thing I want to ask, and you can guys answer Ariane through the chat, is think about what attracts a hummingbird. What are the characteristics of the flowers that attract a hummingbird that they need when they're, they're coming to your yard? Like what are the colors, the shape of the flower, when it blooms, when it's available, does it stand out? What are some of the things that you guys think, using the chat, that you're going to find? All right. So some of the things I always think about is the red color, the yellow. They're usually tubular flowers, long and skinny, uh, to match the shape of the bill. Uh, they're very showy. They, they stick out. They're easy to spot, especially from flying out to the distance. These things um, need to be out there in the open. Now, also, they've got to provide a lot of empty calories because they're just on this migration. They, they just spent a lot of energy to get here. Can you think of any other species that take advantage of this situation? Well, I can think of one, and that is us, humans. As we go down, I, and I joke with this McDonald's sign, but it does basically have the same kind of concept. It's brightly colored. It's easy to see. It's recognizable. It has a lot of empty calories and it's on the side of that, our migration route so that when we are moving up and down uh, that we are able to find the food. We need you, if you want hummingbirds, to put a McDonald's sign in your yard and that's what we're going to talk about. And one of the first things that you can do to try to attract those hummingbirds, of course, is your feeder care. Step one is feeders. So first thing you got to do is, and the easiest thing that you can do is to attract hummingbirds is to have good feeders. And what you notice about this feeder, of course, is it's got that red base, a glass jar, and a red top. What you notice it does not have is that red food coloring. And it's perfectly fine not to have that to attract those hummingbirds. So let's talk a little bit about the appetite of a hummingbird. Because we mentioned that it has a lot of empty calories. About 75% of a hummingbird's diet is sugar water. About 25%, which is pretty surprising to some people, is that they eat a lot of insects. And they eat insects that we do not like to have around our house. You know, I know a lot of us don't like to have mosquitoes. How about gnats, aphids? How about noceums? Maybe small spiders or caterpillars. Some of these things actually all fall prey to the hummingbird because if you gave your kid a Coca-Cola and just a diet of Coca-Cola, they're gonna run around and flap their wings about 80 times per second. 
but they're not going to be able to grow very much. So to be able to get that kid to grow, what you need to do is have some protein, to have some fats, to have some other carbohydrates just besides the sugar water. And you can get that through the insects. So insects are actually an important part of a hummingbird's diet. Now, typically, on a daily basis, a hummingbird needs to eat about only three to seven calories per day. Think about that. That is not very much at all. That doesn't sound like hardly anything. But if you are a hummingbird, or you are a human-sized hummingbird, for you to be able to survive on a daily basis, it would be 155,000 calories you would have to consume each day just to survive. So let's take a look at these three items. So how many tombstone pizzas would that be to be able to survive as a hummingbird? How many tombstone pizzas would you have to eat? This is a Supreme, so it's got all the toppings, all the fixings. Would you have to eat to be able to survive on a daily basis? If you want to answer, you can go ahead by chat. It'd be 117. 117 pizzas you would have to do to survive. How about Snicker Bars? That's 553. How about Coke? Coca-Cola. A lot of empty calories there, a lot of sugar water. 1,107. So for you to be able to survive as a human-sized hummingbird, you have to be able to eat that many calories just to survive every day. Which, if you're a hummingbird, that equates to about three to seven calories. What kind of feeders do we want? What kind of feeder tips do you need? It's very important for you to be able to take care of your feeders. These feeders are critical for the hummingbirds to be able to feel comfortable to come and stay at your feeder. If you say let your feeder go and it gets kind of moldy or the sugar water's not just quite right, they're gonna abandon your spot and go to a better place. So if you wanna keep hummingbirds in your yard, you wanna keep them around and keep them for the long term and keep them healthy, here's the tips that we recommend. We do not recommend anybody going and buying store-bought hummingbird nectar. A lot of times these have red nectar in them, or red food coloring. That red food coloring is not metabolized by the hummingbirds. It often comes out of the urine. Their kidneys cannot handle it. It has also been shown to cause a feather rot, which is very important uh, for the hummingbirds that have clean feathers to be able to fly. They do not fly very well. They will not migrate if they are covered in the red food coloring. Even the clear sugar nectar uh, that you get at the stores can be detrimental. Uh, the American Zoos and Aquariums Association have been finding out through captive hummingbirds, that some of these mixtures are very difficult to, to have to hummingbirds because it can cause premature death due to the mineral and vitamin mixtures. They can't seem to get it right, particularly with iron, and they notice premature death. So we recommend that you just make your own from plain old sugar water. Make it just like Mother Nature does. So four parts water, one part sugar. All you need. You don't need it anymore. If you make it too strong, you'll attract a lot of insects. If you make it too weak, they may not like it. So no red food coloring and just a mixture of a four to one. Also, we recommend glass jars. The reason we like glass jars is because they're easier to clean and they don't scratch. It's okay to have plastic, but you've got to watch them a little bit more carefully because if they scratch as you're cleaning them, it gives more surfaces for mold and uh, bacteria to be together, which can harm your hummingbird. It makes your hummingbird nectar get bad uh, quicker. Also, during this time of heat, like we are today, where I think we're supposed to get a, a heat index of 105 degrees, uh, that sugar water will ferment pretty easily. So we recommend that you change your sugar water about every three to four days. That seems to be the best. And if you're going to clean uh, them, and I clean them every time you change the water, do not use soap or bleach to do that. That leaves a residue that can harm the hummingbirds. Uh, if you do have problems with mold, we recommend a, a mild vinegar solution uh, to kind of clean it out, and then you thoroughly wash it out with hot water after that. All right, one of the other things you gotta watch out for is uh, one of the things that hummingbird males will do is they actually will defend their territory, which is usually food sources. The males do not participate in raising the young at all. All they do is, is, is mate and then defend food resources, sometimes even from the females. So they often will let females in there. They will sit on your feeders and it makes it very difficult for other hummingbirds to get there. Uh, male hummingbirds territory is about a quarter of an acre. 
So the way that you can kind of defeat him, make it harder for him to be there, and you can have more hummingbirds, is put up more feeders, put him in more diverse areas. This is where it's harder for him to defend. So you might put, if you have a bush in your backyard, you might put a hummingbird feeder on either side, or maybe at the corner of the houses. Uh, these are some different kind of techniques to kind of break up that male's territory, makes it hard for him to thin. During the month of July, August, September, a lot of times he forgets about being territorial and is more concerned about building up his weight. Often the males will leave early, so they usually aren't a factor when you get to late August anyway. So let's talk about a little bit about a common question I often get, and that is a true or false question. And you can answer it if you think you know the answer on your chat, all right? So one of the more common questions we get is, will, if you leave your feeder up in the fall, like in September and October, will you jeopardize a hummingbird by not allowing it to migrate? Will that hummingbird stick around? This is, this is something that often gets asked all throughout this time period. What do you say, true or false? You leave the feeder up, the hummingbird doesn't migrate. Is that true or false? That actually is false. Uh, these guys are already wired to move on further. Now we did have a hummingbird, a ruby throat hummingbird that stayed into December, but most likely this was because uh, he was not equipped to fly south yet. He did not have enough fat or resources or he had an injury that did not allow him to do so. These hummingbirds are wired to be able to fly south. So you can leave your feeders up as long as you want, just as long as you keep them clean. In fact, actually, if you leave your feeders up, you might help the poor little root throats that aren't are having a little bit of a struggle. And maybe you'll get some of the ones like the black chin or the rufus that are coming in on the other end from Alaska or Colorado you might have a friend all winter long. Step number two, let's talk about flowers. Uh, probably one of the most important things that you can do is actually have a lot of flowers. The more flowers that attract hummingbirds to your yard, the more opportunities to have more hummingbirds. Uh, it breaks up that male's territory. A lot more of them can survive. They can get insects from there. They can get pollen, uh, nectar, and uh, they can have a diverse habitat. They feel a little bit more comfortable there. I also might have some shelter. Here you see a hummingbird actually visiting a common milkweed. Not typically a plant that is associated with hummingbirds, a lot more with your monarch butterflies, but it's something that they can get some nectar out of and it has a nice smell to it. But as we kind of mentioned before when we were talking about feeders and that McDonald's, what is the perfect flower? Well, you know, for a hummingbird, they need a flower that attracts, is attracted to red and yellow colors. Maybe even purple's okay. Uh, they don't usually have a scent. Why do they not have a scent? Why do you guys think that they don't have a, a scent for those flowers? Why is it important? Well, scent actually attracts bees and wasps, which often destroy the flowers that hummingbirds like to come to. And hummingbirds, like most birds, do not have a sense of smell. They don't know that, that common milkweed has a fragrance, but they do know that it provides a lot of nectar for them. A lot of these flowers are also that are very hummingbird specific, have a long tubular flower. Um, they don't have landing purchases on them. That doesn't make it easy for the hummingbirds, but it makes it really hard for your wasp and bees, which will actually tear right through the flower to get to the nectar. And that often destroys flowers. So those flowers, that does them no good. Those bees and wasps aren't actually pollinating that particular flower. Often these, of course, these flowers bloom during the day and they're large and showy, so they can attract those hummingbirds. One of the things that we always recommend is that we recommend uh, always native plants for hummingbirds. If you want to have hummingbirds, you cannot put stuff from Europe, Japan, or Australia out there on, on your lawn because no hummingbirds were going to go to it. They might try to visit it, but that plant is not native to here and they're not familiar with it. It's not going to provide them the needs that they have native plants do. Recent studies show that if you can have at least 70% of your yard planted in native, so that could mean trees and bushes and stuff like that that you don't often think about, you can actually have a really great place for birds to be able to survive. Not just hummingbirds, but cardinals and chickadees and woodpeckers and things like that, because these guys need a lot of different kinds of insects to raise their young. 95% of all songbirds 
use insects to feed their young during the nesting season. So by even just having one oak tree in your yard, there's 557 different kinds of caterpillars that will be attracted to that, compared to something like a ginkgo, which has zero caterpillars attracted to that. It provides nothing for those animals, those birds, like hummingbirds, for instance. So the more native plants that you can plant in the yard, the greater chance you're not attracted to hummingbirds, but other wildlife as well. Some of the ones that we recommend is the trumpet creeper, which is a large vine. Sometimes people nickname it American kudzu. Uh, it's definitely one that you do not want to plant on uh, your house because it has, it's, it's a strong vine that can actually rip off fascia boards or gutters. So an old fence, maybe an old barn, maybe an old structure in the back is a great place to put trumpet honeysuckles. You'll be covered up in hummingbirds in July. Also Indian pink often blooms in it's a little harder to find, but it is a great one. It's a perennial that will bloom in May. Hummingbirds love it. It can survive a little bit of shade, and it helps self-propagate itself by its seed pods exploding in certain temperatures in July, which is always kind of fun to watch. And lastly, in this time of year, August and even into September, cardinal flower can be a popular one. It's a very showy flower. It does uh, attract a lot of hummingbirds. The only negative about it is that it it's, its neck berries are very small, and so a lot of hummingbirds are not, they can only get a little bit of nectar out of it. A few more that I want to mention is the royal catchfly, which is another summer bloomer. Uh, trumpet honeysuckle, which I had talked about before, which can actually rebloom, so it would be one of the early spring ones, as well as uh, may rebloom later in the year. And lastly, but most importantly, is the wild columbine. And the reason I want to mention that one in particular is that as hummingbirds are coming back in the spring, that wild columbine can actually, uh, will, is, is very specific to hummingbirds, is, is a hummingbird specific pollinated plant. And it will bloom when the hummingbirds show up for the first time in the beginning of April. So when those hungry little hummingbirds come up, that's an important plant to have in your yard, to be able to keep them around. Um, you know, not everybody always has a, a large garden or a, a large yard. Uh, maybe they don't have, they live in an apartment. It is okay to put things in a container garden. Uh, hummingbird, you can have a feeder on a balcony and then you can have container gardens uh, with some of those native plants that hummingbirds will be attracted to and you'll have just as much fun as someone that has a big backyard. Step three, of course, is shelter. You know, anytime that you want to attract any wildlife to your yard, you always want to be able to provide shelter. Uh, hummingbirds are no different. They have to have a place where they can kind of feel safe. They're going to be able to visit those flowers, particularly they need a place that they can call home away from the territorial male or maybe some predators or even the sun can be a little too brutal for those hummingbirds. We definitely notice less activity during the middle of the day when it's the hottest. Uh, than we do it in the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. So hummingbirds definitely need some sort of shelter. But it can be hard to find those hummingbirds when they're in that shelter. They're gonna, they're gonna take any advantage of any kind, vines, trees, or bushes. But can you guys find the hummingbirds in this picture? How many are there? If you wanna answer by chat, feel free. All right, there's one. All right, good. And there's the other one. There's only two in there. They're hiding in there. Pretty hard to find. You can imagine if they had a nest, how difficult it would be to find at the top of a tree. So one of the things that shelter also provides is good nesting habitat. Uh, hummingbirds here in Kentucky typically will build their nest. It's only made by the female. It's about the size of a walnut, and it's made out of lichen. It's made out of spider web and plant down and leaves. It's very well hidden in the fork of a tree, about 10 to 50 feet up. That female will build that about three to four hours a day and takes about five to seven days to do it. And during that time period, she's already, been, uh, she's already got eggs in her. Once she starts settling down, she will lay about two to three eggs about the size of a kernel of corn, not very big at all. And she will raise those young for the next 21 days uh, until they are able to fledge. It takes about two weeks for her to incubate them and another three weeks to be able to get them out and flying around visiting your feeders. 
here in Kentucky, we can have about three broods. So we know that last week we got a report of a female hummingbird still raising some babies that were very close to fledged. So we are probably seeing the very last brood right now visiting our feeders and in our yards. So here's a mama feeding her babies, probably some mosquitoes, some no CMs, uh, some gnats, maybe a little bit of sugar water mixed in there. It's amazing with that large bill that she's able to be so delicate. All right, next step, uh, step four, of course, is water. You have shelter, you got food, you got water. How many birds need water just like the rest of us? A lot of times these guys get their water from um, the rain. They can actually get it from a puddle. They are not a walking bird. They cannot, they do not have the ability to walk. They can perch, but they do not have the ability to walk. So they often will have to land in shallow pools of water uh, to be able to, 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 to take advantage of that water. Some of that water they can get from feeders, but they will often get a lot of water from raindrops. Or if you want to attract them to your yard, you can put a sprinkler up during the hottest part of the day and they'll fly through there and you can watch them preening and cleaning themselves. But you can also get misters uh, at your local bird stores to be able to provide a, a good source of water for them that's easy for them to clean themselves as well as for them to drink. And step five, attention and care. Now this is where we try to get to do some troubleshooting. You know, I, I think if I were to ask you, if you guys wanted to put in the chat, uh, what are some of the problem areas that you have? What other species of animals that do get attracted to your bird feeders, particularly your hummingbird feeders? Maybe it's ants, maybe it is uh, bees. Here at the nature station, we have a big problem with squirrels and raccoons that will often tear them apart. And we'll, we'll even get raccoons during the day that will climb up the pole, tip it, and pour the sugar water directly into their mouth. Uh, these are big problems, so, but there are some simple solutions. One solution for, particularly for the ants, is to put on an ant moat or an ant guard. And what that is, is just basically a cup at the top of your feeder that you fill it with water, maybe on a daily basis, that makes it harder for those ants to be able to cross. Some ants are able to do it because they can walk on water tension, but for the most part, it's pretty successful. If you don't want to spend the money on an ant moat, you can always take a large garlic, drill a hole in it, put it on top, upside down on top of your feeder, fill it with water and some plumber's putty uh, to make a water seal, and that works just as well. As far as bees and honeybees, one of the big couple things that you need to do is one, you need to clean your feeders often. Uh, you can also purchase bee guards or a feeder that has bee guards that makes it more difficult for them to be able to feed off of it. As well as um, you can reduce the sugar water instead of a four to one ratio, to a five to one ratio. So make it less sweet. The hummingbirds will still come to a five to one ratio, but the, the bees are, and the wasps are less likely to do so. But part of the most part is to keep it clean and, and change it often. Now, pop quiz. What is the scariest thing that frightens a hummingbird? Take your guess. A car, a window, what, what scares them the most? Of course, it's Mr. Kitties. Probably one of the most effective predators that you're gonna find against a hummingbird. There are a few others, but this one definitely has the capability and skill to be able to capture lots of hummingbirds. And it's one that is preventable. It's preventable by either hanging your hummingbird feeder higher, if you have cats, neighborhood cats that won't leave them alone, or you keep your cat indoors. Some other things to kind of watch out for that hummingbirds sometimes get in, in trouble with, some of the Chinese mantids, man, man, praying mantises. Uh, these are the large introduced species of praying mantises that um, can grow up to six inches. If you see one on your feeder, I would definitely get rid of that. Um, you might, some spider webs are strong enough. Thistle has a tendency to sometimes capture a hummingbird. Um, bullfrogs, uh, maybe a kestrel, all have that capability as well. All right, one of the more common questions we also get is how many hummingbirds do we have in our yard? Some people think that they actually only have a few. You might be surprised because you're not seeing all the hummingbirds that are visiting your feeders at all the same time. What scientists have figured out is that during the breeding season, 
you can times the number of hummingbirds that you see in a day by three, but during migration, you want to times it by five. So if you see three hummingbirds in one uh, during the day at your house, uh, different at the same time, so like you saw three at the same time, you times that by five, you have 15 hummingbirds in your yard. That's how you know a rough estimate of how many hummingbirds that you have in your now what I would like to do is kind of open it up to anybody that has questions about hummingbirds. Uh, see if you've enjoyed the program and let us know also if you would like to see any other future programs here at the Nature Association. But enjoy the rest of the migration. All right, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Go ahead. All right, so our first one is, what are some plants that work well in zucchini? That's a great question. Um, we were having that discussion a little bit earlier. Um, I've definitely seen wild columbine, which is a great hummingbird plant, do well in a container. Uh, rose verbena would be another one, but you can almost put any native plant into a container as long as you take care of it. Indian pink probably would do fine in there as well. Um, raw catchfly, cardinal flower, they get a little leggy, so they would be a little difficult. We do have another question. Okay. Uh, why do hummingbirds spend so much energy fighting with each other? Why do hummingbirds spend so much time fighting with each other? That's a great question. And um, the, the, the question, the answer is, I don't know, really. It does seem a little wasteful for them to do it. Uh, obviously, it's important for the males to be able to provide resources for the females. That way, if he holds the, the best flowering tree, or, or patch of flowers, then he's probably gonna be able to mate with more females. Uh, it does seem con contradiction, but a lot of times what males do to attract females always seems like a lot of wasteful energy. Uh, take a look at something like a peacock that spends so much energy in the way that it looks and its tail feathers, it's amazing that it spends that kind of energy just for being able to mate. The opportunity to, to pass on your genes is too great of an opportunity for a hummingbird, so it's, it's probably worth the amount of energy it burns off. Other questions? All right, well, thank you. And I'd like to also thank um, a couple people that helped with that, and that's Shannon. Oh, wait, we've got one more, okay. I heard an Anna's was cited here. Would they interbreed with the Rubies? Okay, so there, there was a, uh, somebody had heard that an Anna's um, hummingbird was spotted here. That is definitely a bird that is away from its normal uh, environment. And, uh, as far as I know, it would not mate with a, with a ruby-throated hummingbird. They are pretty far from each other, uh, don't have that kind of opportunities. Uh, it is not unusual for us, even in Kentucky and Tennessee, to get weird birds here. They often get blown here by hurricanes, maybe a storm that goes east to west or west to east. Uh, so something like that can happen. I have not heard about the Anna's yet, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we often get rufous and black chin hummingbirds here during the winter months. Uh, we have had a green violet ear in Cincinnati documented. That's a very unusual one since that is a tropical species. I've even heard of some like the buff bellied being seen as far as South Carolina, which is a Western species. So it is not unusual for something like that to be, find its way here, but it most likely would not be able to breed with the ruby throat. Other questions? I do want to kind of also comment that Anna's also breeds in January where the ruby throat won't even be here during that time period. So their, their cycles would not match up. All right, any other questions? Good questions. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the... Uh, I mean, go ahead, go ahead, good, good question. Yeah, there might, there might be a question delay. Uh, what trees do you recommend for them in our yard? Okay, that's a great question. What kind of trees do you recommend? Of course, any trees that you have in your yard is gonna provide some sort of shelter, whether it's native or not native. If you're looking at something for like a blooming tree that might be really good uh, for, for nectar for them, I'm gonna give you two examples. One is uh, 
uh, well, uh, any of the Buckeyes. Uh, so you like your, your red Buckeyes, your Ohio Buckeyes, sometimes also known as the yellow Buckeye, are hummingbirds uh, plants, or trees. And then um, one that we find is very, very popular with hummingbirds in our backyard is a black locust. You can get a black locust cultivar that doesn't have the thorns, but still provides the pretty flowers and the nectar for the hummingbirds. Other questions? I'm excited. I'm getting some good questions, everybody. Yeah. Well, we're waiting for any more questions. I also want to recommend this is our first Zoom webinar. And and so any any help that you guys have on, on watching it, let us know uh, how you liked it. And any further webinars that you would like to see, whether it's attracting bats, whether it's attracting bluebirds or butterflies, maybe it is a wild edible program. Uh, there is a, a wide area that we can cover. Uh, maybe birding and LBL, we'd be glad to, to try to work it out during this time where we're a little bit more stationed at home. All right, well, I, I think we, didn't, we don't have any more questions otherwise. If you do, just feel free to contact the Nature Station at 270-924-2299 if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a good day and then have some fun watching some hummingbirds. And we will still have hummingbirds here until October. Thank you.